Most of us overvalue what we have and we undervalue what we have to gain by taking the risk, okay. you know? First of all, everybody is in business for him or herself. You know, my crew people, if they only knew that they have far more to do with their pay increases and their promotions than the manager or I ever did. But what do they do? They work for me for three or four weeks, three or four months, leave mad at the manager or mad at me, and never stop to think, how many times did I smile and thank the customer? How many times did I hold the door for a person who was on a cane? How many times did I ask them for repeat business? How many times did I call in when I really could have come to work? How many times did my grandmother die? Most people only have two, and they never realize you're in control of that. And I just wish that more people understood that. Ready? Ready to rock and roll? Is that action? All right. Okay. Yes. That's right. All right. Absolutely. Go. 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 Hello, everybody. It's Jason Will with Go. 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 This is a real estate podcast. But, but, we talk about leadership, personal growth, and becoming the best version of yourself. Leadership, check one, two, check one, two, grow the best version of yourself. Go, go, go. So this is a real estate podcast. Hey, welcome everybody to a super impactful episode of the Impact Agent Podcast. I am joined with... I think one of the most prominent business leaders in the city of Birmingham, (laughs) Mr. Larry Thornton. Larry, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I love that great intro. Awesome. Well, I know you're like a super busy uh, man, right? And so uh, we've been trying to get you in the studio for a while now, and I'm just so glad that we were able to make it happen. Great. Good to be here. We can share. I met you at a Vestavia Hills Chamber of Commerce meeting, and I love the Vestavia Hills Chamber because they bring in all these like super impactful speakers, you know, and you were like one of my favorites of 2021 when you brought us this book. And then I, so I was just blown away. Like I, I took a picture of you speaking at the chamber meeting and then I put a quote under the picture and I put it on Facebook. And then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to reach out to him and see if he wants to do a podcast because I think you have so much to share. And then I, you know, when you go to these things and get these books, you know, I think I've been to a lot of real estate trainings and seminars and just sales and business seminars for that matter. And they're always like, write a book. It gives you more credibility. So I thought, all right, well, here's Larry's book, right? But then I started diving into it and literally every page, every other page, I'm highlighting sentences and paragraphs. So that's pretty uh, cool. That's pretty yeah. cool. So tell us about, you know, where you come from and, and what your childhood was all about and kind of how you got where you are today. Absolutely. Well, Jason, thanks, uh, first of all, for having me and uh, finding my material worth sharing. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. I will tell yeah. you, uh, our coming together at the Vestavia Chamber, I might have mentioned that day that that's where I started my career. As soon as I graduated college, uh, I was recruited out of the art department to teach art at Vestavia Hills High School. So Vestavia is very special, very unique to me. Uh, I am a big relationship person. And if you've gone through the book, you kind of see that. I I still benefit to this very day from having started my career at Vestavia Hills High School. Wow! And uh, I I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, boy, that's just awesome. If you understand the value of good relationships, other people will I want to say literally, but actually virtually lift you up, uh, Jason, and deliver you unto the desires of your heart. And I hope that I can share some of those uh, examples as we go through this. But going back to childhood, you know, grew up in a little small town called Madison Park. And, uh, you know, nothing particularly unique about that. And I'm kind of rocking along elementary school, middle school, and I uh, have this opportunity to attend Uh, this otherwise all-white school, and that's kind of where life got real for me. I can tell you that I don't know that that was the first time that I realized that I was black, but it was certainly the first time that being black made a difference. Uh, That's the first time that I realized that. So you may know that Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, that landmark ruling, a 9-0 decision in 1954. And of course, that would turn education on its head uh, across this nation. If I could remember it, uh, you know, in the 
field of public education, separate but equal, has no place. Uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote that for the unanimous court back in 1954. But the southern states, uh, legislators and legislatures would work with diabolical creativity to avoid that Brown mandate. So with me having been born in 1954, the ruling was in 1954, there was something kind of interesting about that whole thing because once the southern states moved, then there I was, one of six black students to attend this otherwise all-white Goodwin Junior High School. And uh, without getting too uh, graphic, I mean, you can imagine in 67, 68, how challenging that must have been for a kid who's 12 years old and you're trying to process all of these messages of inferiority on a, on a daily basis. And it affected me academically. And we can talk a little bit more about that you know, as we get into this. Well, I wanted to also just paint the picture for our audience. So again, I'm probably going to say this, be redundant with this during this interview, but you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Right. So I'm looking at things from through a white lens and you're looking at things through a black lens, which is uh, what, you know, potentially could make this a very, very powerful interview. But is it true that the African-American schools, y'all were fine, y'all were doing just fine. Like it wasn't all a better, like you weren't excited to integrate. I mean, you know, nobody sh- was yeah, I mean, <laughs> that I knew <laughs> y'all had great teachers and, and, and the schools were great and academically everything was fine. It, it, you didn't need to integrate with white schools to get better educated or to be in a better environment. Well, there were those who were forward thinking who thought that, yes, having access to better books. I can tell you, I remember the used books that we had. The black schools just didn't get the best that was out there. Uh, that's just a fact. I mean, we, we, we still deal with that today. And there's a social construct that drives a lot of what I'm talking about. So we had a forward-thinking attorney who lived in uh, the Madison Park area, So there was no mandate. Uh, The state of Alabama created a little term called freedom of choice, which gave black students an opportunity to attend otherwise all white schools. And this attorney was very avid about the belief that inside of those doors was the opportunity for getting a better education. And he, his daughter, myself, and four other students were the first six blacks to integrate this school at at Goodwin. But I will tell you that (laughs) rather than getting an education, uh, math and science and history and civics and that kind of thing, I was kind of getting schooled in uh, my inferiority, uh, who I wasn't. Uh, I was less than. And I will tell you that I bought into it. I bought into it hook, line, and sinker. One very memorable day for me during that school year was later in the school year when Dr. King was killed. And I remember, Jason, the somber, sad, unfortunate feeling and the atmosphere in my community and in my house. My mom crying and my dad was um, noticeably different. Uh, It was a significant loss. And then to come to school the next day and as we exited the school bus to experience this joyful, jubilant, celebratory atmosphere was difficult for me to calibrate. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't put the two together. What was that? What is that? And uh, but that that memory uh, tends to stay with me and haunt me a little bit today. Uh, the Dr. King of that day versus how well he's received today. In fact, the probably the last pieces, uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about my art, but probably the last four to five pieces have been requested by white friends or speakers. That would never have been 30 years ago. That would yeah. never have been 40, 50 years ago. Right. And I just kind of watched the evolution of the meaning of this great mind that stood for civil and human rights. Uh, and to this day, uh, I think I have an image of him in my book, and that is my favorite because I know what that meant. That kind of a pivotal moment of losing him during that school year and the impact that it had on me kind of going forward. Yeah. I mean, I, what was going through my head as, as you were talking was, you know, I was attending the university of South Alabama in Mobile 
when uh, 9-11 happened. And we had episodes. There's a there's a pretty you know significant Muslim population in Mobile. And so there was some celebratory things that were happening with some of the Muslims there. You know, of course, not all. But, you know, that that incited some anger among, you know, patriotic Americans. And so, you know, in your instance, we're all Americans, we're all human beings, and one race is celebrating the death of the other, the assassination of the other. So, yeah, so I think, you know, there's a lot of things I think people don't understand. You know, they come from judgment and not curiosity. And so that's what, you know, I think is a great, uh, hopefully, byproduct of this conversation. Because you were filled with anger. Where you did It made you this angry, young black man. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think what you and I are talking about, in my opinion, this is just Larry Thornton editorializing. There's what you call willful ignorance. Uh, this is how I am. This is how I believe. This is how I think. But I, I'd like to believe, and we operate on a daily basis through the Why Not Win Institute from the premise that there's a good bit of innocent ignorance, that if I knew better, if I could think better, and I'd like to think throughout the pages of my book, I've tried to illustrate uh, examples of individuals who thought that they felt a certain way about blacks or about a Muslim or about women or about children or about, I will tell you that, you know, in the space of ethnicity, gender, sexuality, housing status, educational level, you know, we all have biases, Mm -hmm. all of us, in my opinion. But are we willing to have the internal debate and the dialogue with ourselves. I mean, I love what NCCJ does. I love what the Civil Rights Institute does. I love what uh, Leadership Birmingham and Leadership Alabama, all of those are great platforms for creating an opportunity to discuss change and the reason why it ought to happen. But I tend to believe that it's more of an internal piece, an internal piece. Can we call the question to ourselves when we see women when we see someone of a different sexual orientation, are we willing to have and answer that question? Is this honest, the way I feel and what I see? Is this just, uh, is this the best that I can do? And I think that the answer for most of us is no, it's not. And if you are willing to have that debate so as to write what vision you have and how we, versus how we ought to see other people. And uh, the Institute tends to spend a lot of time on that. In the latter part of the prologue of my book, I pose a question that has become perhaps the most profound piece of the discussion in any of the sessions that we have. And the question is this, what is it that you see when you see me? What is it that I see when I see you? That, that's the question. And so if we want to be better, Uh, You know, and and here again, I approach life with the assumption that most people want to be better. Being better means getting closer to winning in life, being more receptive, being more inclusive. And if I had a better opinion and an opportunity, case in point, I went into Leadership Birmingham with, with very fixed opinions about affirmative action. I went into Leadership Birmingham with a very fixed opinion about abortion, but to hear both sides of the argument, intelligible reasoning, you know, we can think differently if we are willing and if we are deliberate. And when it comes to social construct, I think we are all uh, hit by it, even within races, within the race. Yes. You know, I can give you an example. Uh, You know, let's I'll, I'll share this. It'll sound kind of counterintuitive, but it's true. So I'm taking my first flight out of the country. I left Birmingham, uh, went to Buffalo, and we're about to get on the larger flight, which is about a nine, 10 hour flight to Turin, Italy. This was in 2000, somewhere in there. Never been out of the country. I'm sitting on this huge 747. I'm looking at these large engines, wondering how can this thing stay in the air for nine hours? Did they put enough fuel in it? So you've got all of these questions running through your head. Well, as I'm sitting there, out of the cockpit walks a black pilot. Well, 
I've never seen a black pilot before in my life. Right. And I was ashamed of what I felt and the questions and the uneasiness. See, social construct. Had I watched it on a television program so that it wasn't so foreign. And, and I can't tell you how embarrassed, but I'm being honest here. Yeah. I, it, it hurt me how I felt. Can this guy get me? Now, had I been on the ground and I watched this black pilot go on and Jason was about to take his, I said, hey, go brother. That is awesome, Jason. But, you know, hope everything go. You know, isn't that so? so but here's the unique thing. Yeah. This was a private jet flight, NBC chartered plane. Every seat on the plane was first class. <laughs> Never been on a plane like that. And the same gentleman who flew us there flew us back. I made it my business. Why? Because I care. I made it my business to get into the cockpit. And I introduced myself. I told this gentleman how I felt. He was so forgiving and so care. He says, listen, I'm, I'm accustomed to it. He has a piece of my artwork right now. Wow. We developed a relationship and I just apologized. Now, what does that do? Here's what that does. So we're about to fly to the Masters uh, on our Coca-Cola jet. We have two pilots. In the cockpit was a female pilot. I've never seen a female pilot, but I had a completely different reaction because she wouldn't be in the cockpit if she couldn't fly the plane. Same as with the black dude. So I grew as a result of that. And I think most people want to grow because we can win more completely when we invite others in. So when we're more inclusive, it's good for us. It helps us to win. And throughout the book, you'll see some of those examples, I believe. Well, it, it, so it sounds to me like there's these the social construct is like a trigger for you. Like when you're faced with things where you're questioning another race or another gender, or even people, like you said, within your own race and gender, that's a trigger to seek to understand or to seek to relate or to seek to find a common ground, you know, coming from curiosity and, and not judgment. And then the relationships that are fostered from that engagement is pretty oh, powerful. Let me, powerful. I, I want to be just, uh, so transparent on something I'm struggling with that's on TV right now. Okay. And just let me know if anything we talk about you're not comfortable talking about. But so I, I cannot watch TV, the news, like the morning news or the evening news without commercials coming on that from quote unquote Christian conservative uh, political candidates that are making transgender this concept of transgender first of all it's a concept or they're they're making it seem like something that people in Alabama are deliberately teaching and they're turning otherwise heterosexual males and females into transgender i wrestle with this because like we're all god's children you know homosexuals went through this in in, in decades prior where they're like oh that's they're they're homosexual because they want to be they're homosexual because they're sinners or they're they're possessed by demons or they're being taught this or it's a form of rebellion. And so here we are again. And so now it's not homosexuals, it's transgender. And I'm sure you turn your TV on and see things like this. You know, people using social constructs for political gain. How do you how do you reason with that? Well, I would reason with it the same way I would children who had no rights once upon a time. Women who had no rights once upon a time, African Americans, and you can just go down the list. And to your point, here we are. I think uh, love and respect is always appropriate. I think that perhaps we do not know a lot of what we think we know. Uh, I love the way Confucius puts it. He says that <laughs> to know is to know that you know nothing. And if we could operate on that premise, I think Erica uh, <clears throat> Bardu has it in one of her, her songs. You know, the man who knows something knows that he knows nothing at all. And if we operated from that premise and have these opinions that we have, I mean, I grew up with fixed opinions about homosexuality based upon how the community felt yeah. and the things that were said, social constructs. So I had to be big enough 
to see different. I can see it right now. My uncle, who would say often when it comes to homosexuality, and perhaps I can only imagine if he were having to deal with this transgender uh, circumstance that we find in the community, he had said so clearly, if you're born with the parts, boy, that's what you is. Yeah. You know, well, that sounds simple, very black and white, but I don't know, Jason, and you don't know. None of us knows. We have opinions and strong opinions, but let's reserve some opportunity to understand. I know that when I went to speak in Louisiana at Southern University and the gentleman who invited me there to speak called me just as I'd gotten settled into my hotel room and he said, Larry, I cannot be there tonight. I said, I thought you were going to introduce me, man. He said, I I know. So he wasn't explaining why he wasn't going to come and I didn't ask. But toward the end of the conversation, he said to me, Larry, my 11-year-old son committed suicide today. And he and I had had conversations about the persuasion or the thoughts. I don't know. We don't know. But I know the hurt and the pain that my buddy felt and that I felt for him. And if this young man operated from a different social construct, and if he could have gotten through the next two, three, four, five years so that he gets more confident with who he is, Mm -hmm. maybe he'd still be with us. I'm at a program and we had a young lady talking about being gay and how she was ostracized by the family, only received by her older brother. And But that only lasted, she said, until he became a Baptist minister. Now she doesn't have access to her nieces and nephews. There's another brother on there who talked about jogging one morning and he's meeting this white guy And the guy goes for his gun until they got close enough to realize that they were neighbors. But that could have ended ugly. He told the same story about how his granddad had raised him. I'm just giving you these examples. How he had raised him. His granddad was a Black Panther and had taught him to hate all white people. And one night, their car broke down, he said. And this white gentleman helped them to get back to town, repaired the car to get back to town. And thank God that this granddad was big enough, big enough to say to his son, you know, son, for all of these years, I have taught you wrong. And I want to apologize to you. It was just so heartwarming to hear that story. Mm -hmm. Another gentleman comes out. All of these stories were on the same stage. Another gentleman comes out. He says, my name is Jerry. Uh, When I was born, the doctors brought me to my mother and said, congratulations, you have a beautiful baby girl. Only I'm not a girl. I've never been a girl, and I'll never be a girl. And he talked about, as a toddler, the challenges and the difficulties. Now, it was interesting because everyone in the audience was about my age for the most part. Well, we've come from a different social construct, and it wasn't easy to hear that. And I always, the whole time that this person is talking, and I'm thinking about my uncle (laughs) and the statement that he made. But we don't know, Jason. And he tried to commit suicide at 11, he said, but now he's transitioning. And, uh, you know, we have in our restaurants maybe three, and I try to have open conversations with these young men. One gentleman is 15, so I was very careful because of the age and all, but he's transitioning. He's already taking the hormones, developing. So it's just that we're in a different space, but let's kind of chill a little bit, open up, and understand. I think that's the whole message. That's what we drive through the book. That's what we drive through the Institute. Life just happens to not be as black and white as we would like to think or believe. And I don't know of any situation that could present itself that doesn't um, demand or deserve, I should say is a better word, our love, our respect, and our understanding. Mm, Gosh, that's so powerful. Well, I want to talk about your transition from a you know, young man who thought the world was working against him to a young man who realized that the world was working for him. I mean, you went from this angry, negative mindset to this super abundant, positive, intentional, purposeful mindset. How are, you know, how are you able to outlast that season of negativity and, and, and evolve into this season of positivity, which has brought you to where you are now? 
Well, imagine uh, the strength of what you've just said. How were you able to survive that season? And I think about my buddy Ron's son, just mm -hmm. surviving the season. And the kid who's now transitioning, very peaceful, happy, seems to be joyful, enjoying life. We don't know. I was convinced in the ninth grade, in the 10th grade at Robert E. Lee in the 11th grade, I was convinced that white people were evil. I hated white. I hated white paper because of all the <laughs> messages. And the, I mean, you just think about being punched and pinched and, you know, just every, it was just unbelievable. I must be nothing. This many people can you know, and so I'm wrestling with my mother's opinion of how she felt about me and how I, you know, all day at school. So I'm thinking, why did she do this? Why am I here? I don't have to be. All of my homies are back at Booker T. Washington. Why are we doing this? Yeah. But it was my time to lean into a situation. Uh, if I had to go back to that 12-year-old uh, Larry and talk to that individual, and if you can survive this, I love the way you put that. If, I, if you could get through this season of your life, you're going to be positioned. The universe, I believe, has positioned me to take full advantage of that season. So understanding little things like from where we came, dogs were dogs. They were in the yard. And they came and they went. They ate what we didn't eat, never went to the vet and all of that, what would you have today. So we get to the white schools and Dogs are not dogs. Dogs are family members. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, can you imagine that, man? We get back home and we talk about all this. If a white kid said, mom and dad had a fight last night, they typically meant argument. If I said that in our community, blood was drawn. Right. That's a fight. Uh, another little nuance was, um, you know, you'd hear kids say, well, you, you meet me at 3.30 and I'll kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> And I said to my buddy, uh, Eddie, who was also one of the six, I said, wow, man, can you believe that? These guys playing their fights over here. And it was just like those nuances. Well, when I go to teach school at Vestavia High School, because I was able to survive that season, I understand when an animal has to be put down, what it means to that family. And since then, I've had a dog in the house, mm -hmm. you know. So you, you grow if we can get by the seasons. So just to give you a little texture as to what I think happened for me, uh, because I didn't do well in school, summer school every year, graduated in summer school, I got lost in my art. Thank God for the gift of drawing. And I would draw my way. I would express myself on paper, uh, Jason, to get through some of the turbulence. And what I was drawing wasn't pretty all the time. I got in trouble for what I was drawing. But I was getting that anger out of me and on paper. In the 11th grade, your entire purpose, I think I shared this story a little bit at the talk that you were a part of. In the 11th grade, your entire purpose was to so position your schedule to take senior English from anybody other than this lady named Miss Nichols. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't very smart, so I ended up with Miss Nichols for session room and for senior English. Oh, my God. How, how can I survive? Miss Nichols was a World War II veteran. Uh, I need not say much more than that. Very rigid firm, but she assigned a book to me called The Pilgrim's Progress, clearly the only book I ever read in high school, and just fascinated with the characters who acted out the essence of their names. Miss Nichols placed a B-plus on my desk. Uh, I was shocked, and she was shocked, because that wasn't happening for Larry Thornton. Mm -hmm. But I think it was enough to show her that there was something more to this kid and I'm going to do something about it. What is it that you see when you see me? A third component to that whole scenario is what is it that I see when I see me? Well, Jason, I didn't like very much at all what I saw and what I had been convinced was the image of me. But Ms. Nichols saw it differently. There's something to this kid. Well, it was very customary for me and my dad to go to what we would all refer to as the white folks' house. We'd cut and scrape and dig on Saturdays. Wax paper wrapped sandwiches, paper cups of water out of the back door. 
It was just normal. That's just the way it was. And Ms. Yeah. Nichols knew that we did that. So she invited me to her home to do some yard work. We did very little of any yard work, but that was not her purpose. When it was time for lunch, it was not the typical wax paper wrap sandwiches and paper cups of water in the back door. She invited me in through the front door of her home. It was the most amazing thing for me because it was so different. What is this? And she's talking to me, Jason. She's saying a lot of things that I needed to hear. But I was so busy listening to what she was doing that I heard very little of what she had to say. I'm taking this mental tour of my dad and I in the, at the back door of these homes, going downtown with my mom and having to eat downstairs. My mom never explained why. Uh, but that's what I'm thinking as she's, but she's, she's speaking to me. Well, Jason, here's something for you, which I know you already know, and for your listeners. Some of the most powerful some of the most pointed, some of the most poignant messages that we will ever deliver or receive will occur without the employment of a single word. That's good to know. The messages that we are sending without words. I think it was St. Francis of Assisi who said, go forth and preach the gospel always. And when necessary, use words. Powerful, mm. powerful statement. I do remember Ms. Nichols recapturing my listening attention when she said to me, Larry, I think you ought to go to college. Now, I can't believe of all the people who think that I'm college material <laughs> would be Ms. Nichols. I mean, I'm failing senior English. I'm going to graduate in summer school. Why are you, to my mind, I'm saying, why are you saying that to me? <laughs> but Ms. Nichols was not a frivolous person. She would never have said it if there wasn't merit to it. No one had ever used my name in college in the same sentence prior to that experience. And I left there laughing at her and kind of cutting up with my buddies. Guess what old Battle Axe said yeah. to me? Man, she thinks I ought to go to college. Can you believe that? But subconsciously, it's working on me. And on a different conversation, Ms. Nichols, what would I study in college? She said, well, you've helped me with my bulletin board all year. You can study art. Really, study art, social construct, Jason. All of the books that I had bombed through, whether it was current or whether it had to do with the Baroque styles or the Renaissance periods, all of the artists, El Greco, Titian, Monet, none of those guys looked like me, and they did not look like a woman. Isn't that interesting? Now, one can choose to believe that there was no black talent in those days or no female talent in those days, or we can believe that here's social construct again sending a message so that a woman is not even thinking about art necessarily. I hoped that I could be an artist. I wished that I could. But if a black artist or a female artist had walked into one of my classrooms with his or her portfolio, I mean, imagine what that would do, which is exactly why every time I'm at an inner city school and I'm speaking, I take my portfolio and I'm displaying my art because it's a powerful point of connection. You don't have to wonder anymore. This is what you can do. And when I say that Condoleezza Rice has a piece of my art mm -hmm. in her home, when I say that Oprah Winfrey owns a piece of my art, well, that's huge. That's valuable. Yes. And so having the art doesn't mean that you have to be an artist. I'm still producing art today, but I'm also a business owner. I'm also an entrepreneur. You see, we extend our horizon after we first realize who we are and how we are through our gifts. We all have gifts. We don't explore them as uh, often perhaps as we should, but we have them and they're there. And uh, the, the book was written on the premise that there's so much more to all of us if we knew and we don't know as much. Uh, and a lot of times we close ourselves out because you know of how we think. When you change what you think, you change what you do, period. Yeah. I wonder if that shift wouldn't have happened if she hadn't had made that connection between because art was your refuge. Absolutely. And for her, you know, planting that seed in your mind, like, hey, your your refuge, your passion 
can also be your pursuit in Ugh. academics and life and just going. And you said, you know, silently or quietly, you were always like, I, I would love to be able to do this as a career, sure. but there's, you know, there's, I won't be able to, who would want to buy my art? I mean, this isn't realistic. And then when she made that connection, you were like, she wow. made the connection in the ninth grade, in the 10th grade, in the 11th grade. Jason, I always thought that I had something to offer deep down. I, I always thought that I could make a contribution. I always thought that I could measure up. But the messaging was so strong and so powerful that simply because of hair texture and skin pigment, I couldn't do those things. And once I understood, once I realized, I went to a little junior college studying art and I'm feeling good about myself and then transferring to Alabama State studying art, recruited immediately to what we call the work study program. I became the uh, artist for the athletic department and the yearbook design, which paid for all of my tuition and books. Uh, I'm winning awards, my self-esteem. Well, it's not long if you stay on that progression and if you stay on that trajectory, you get to a point where you realize that, hey, I can do anything and we can. We can if we can somehow believe that we can. So in writing the book, uh, I really wasn't writing a book. I was really gathering information because I wanted to capture those rudiments of thought, those processes of thinking that leads to a winning experience. And it's a it's a legacy piece, right? I mean, like you're I love how you're speaking to family members, like your kids you're stopping to go, hey, I want to make sure you're grasping this lesson. Absolutely. And it's just, it's awesome. I love well, it. Well, uh, who knew that the book would do what it's doing? I mean, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Right today, we have eight colleges and universities that have adopted that book as a mandatory read for credit. We just left East Tennessee State University a few weeks ago. East Tennessee State University has about 14,000 students, 93% majority institution. So we're working with the upper echelon students, the honor students. We had 18 students in that class. They are studying Why Not When as a course credit. Dr. Carson Medley is teaching this book. Well, here's the beauty of, of, of what's happening at East Tennessee State University. We had three students out of the 18 who said to us, my partner Zilla Fluker, that I've never met a black person in my life to get to know. I've seen, of course, here, the, but to get to know. And they were locked in to our presentation. And we talked about much of what you and I are talking about today. Here's the beauty of what's going to happen. Central State University is a historically black college in Ohio. Their honor students are also going through Why Not Win? And we are arranging for those two communities. So East Tennessee State in Appalachia will actually spend three to four days at Central State University. The students at Central State University will spend three to four days in Appalachia. I mean, it's a beautiful Love exposure. It. It's going to be great for both those communities. And we want to duplicate that as often as we can. So the book is really serving as a catalyst to create conversation. Conversations that we're not having that I think that we're ready to have from a race and ethnicity perspective, from a sexuality perspective. Because when you look at the workplace today, it's different. Mm -hmm. It's different. I can't say that it's different, but we still have to package and bottle Coca-Cola. But if Coca-Cola's leadership isn't prepared to deal with today's employee, which might have been uh, yesterday's employee as well, but the social construct didn't allow the realities to be exposed. And so when it comes to these great brands, I mean, I wouldn't take anything for the opportunity of having... Um, started with Coca-Cola in 1979. I mean, through just art. That. Through art. You were painting marketing Absolutely. signs. Mom and pop signs. Which, so following your passion, like you probably didn't think, you know, you, you hope to make a living 
but you didn't maybe expect to make a fortune. But this, your art, your passion, that refuge has put you down this path. I need to have you to come and join me on some of my talks, my friend, (laughs) because you, you, you put such a finer point on it. Your gifts will make a place for you. If our listeners could hear that, particularly the younger group, your gifts will make a place for you if you're willing to unwrap them. We have them. It would be no different than if I were to give you a gift all wrapped up for Christmas and you put it on your shelf at home and you didn't open it, you don't get the benefit of it until you unwrap the gift. And I think that we all uh, have gifts. And uh, I'm so grateful that Ms. Nichols helped me and put me on a trajectory that I don't ever have to end that. Uh, Imagine starting painting signs, the first black to even work in the department, then became advertising manager, $5 an hour. And today, I sit on the board of directors of that same corporation. That's a great American story. It is an awesome African-American story. A lot lot of bravery inside that corporation, too. Ah. I mean, had there ever been an African-American manager in the history of the company before? Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. And if you've gone through the book, you saw some of the challenges that that I had. But, hey, I'm used to challenges. They started in the ninth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and so it worked. I mean, try becoming the first African-American to own a McDonald's in the city of Birmingham. But I'm used to challenges and breaking down doors that didn't open when they should, you yeah. know, fashioning my own key when necessary. Well, I'm wondering if that pilot, I'm sorry to interrupt, but <laughs> oh, I'm no. wondering if that pilot, that the black pilot looked at you and go, what is this joker doing on a private jet? <laughs> and you're looking at him like, does he know how to right. fly this plane? How to plane this plane? <laughs> it's, it, you know, and, and, but, but if we just talked, you see what yeah. I mean? Once we had a chance to talk and we're not talking. Well, East Tennessee State University and Central State University Imagine the conversations that will be had, and each one of those communities will be better for it. That's what it's about. I love what I do for Coca-Cola. I love what I do with McDonald's. I love being on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank Board, Sonova's Bank, and all of those are wonderful platforms. But what I love more than anything else is what I'm doing right now, hoping that listeners are able to realize who they are, what they have to offer, and extend it. And you know why a lot of people don't do more um, than they do? You are an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. But too many people, I think, how can I say, too many people overvalue what they have, Mm -hmm. and they undervalue what they have to gain by taking the risk, by stepping out. There's so much Mm -hmm. more to all of us. But it starts with understanding the opportunity. Case in point, so I'm promoted to advertising manager at Coca-Cola. My boss walks in, and he's got a box of business cards. Jason, I picked up one of those business cards, and I'm looking at my name, Larry D. Thornton, placed right next to the world's most recognized trademark. Well, that's an opportunity, if you see it that way now. Other department heads had business cards, but did they see the opportunity? There's a difference in going to work every day for you and the employees working from a responsibility perspective. And most people do that. But if you can somehow shift to realizing the opportunity that I have to be a part of this brand, of this realty company, of Coca-Cola, I mean, It was like day and night. Larry Thornton, Coca-Cola, that's an opportunity. I don't think that it's a coincidence that I went from $5 an hour to I learned business. That's how I went into business, by studying and watching through Coca-Cola. So if we take advantage of that, let me tell you how people who work from a responsibility perspective. These are the individuals, and maybe we I've been there, maybe you have too, These are the individuals who look at the clock at 10 o'clock and they go, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, (laughs) it's only 10 o'clock. I've got six more hours to go. Well, you can shift your thinking. You don't have to change jobs. Just understand that what does it mean for what can I do to be of service to somebody? How can I take care of the customer as best I can right where I am? And you'll watch yourself shift 
to a two o'clock perspective. That's where you want to be. When you say, oh my God, it's two o'clock already. I hadn't done half the things that I wanted to get done today. That's when you know your life is filled with purpose right where you are, and you'll start to see life move you. Uh, There's a poem in my book, you know, I bargained with life for a penny and life would pay no more. And these are all of the 10 o'clock people. And we're doing everything we can through the Institute. First of all, to teach everybody that you're in business for yourself. Everybody is in business for him or herself. But if you don't know it, you know, my crew people, if they only knew that they have far more to do with their pay increases and their promotions than the manager or I ever did. But what do they do? They work for me for three or four weeks, three or four months, leave mad at the manager or mad at me, and never stop to think, how many times did I smile and thank the customer? How many times did I hold the door for a person who was on a cane? You know, we missed that. How many times did I ask them for repeat business? How many times did I call in when I really could have come to work? How many times did my grandmother die? Most people only have two. But, you know, Jerry, you've told me this story four or five times now, and they never realize you're in control of that. And I just wish that more people understood that. All right. Can we isolate this quote? I just want to make sure that the audience doesn't breeze past or doesn't get lost in in, uh, just the minutia of wisdom that you're sharing today. But you said (laughs) people are uh, too focused on what they have as opposed to what they can gain if they take a risk. How did you word that? Absolutely. I mean, how many times have you heard you're on a job? I struggled with it. So I've got a job and the social construct. You see, you understand my parents didn't raise me to do what I'm doing today. They didn't necessarily raise me not to do it, but, you know, they didn't raise me to do that. I was raised to get the best education I could get, get the best job that I could get. And I'd done both. Why am I still wanting more? What did I wrestle with more than anything else? My benefits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea that I could create my own benefits was completely lost on me. People do it every day. But golly, what am I going to do about insurance? What am I going to do about transportation? Well, in my business today, I have insurance. I have a company vehicle. You know, I can pull into the... Now, here's what happens to more people, and I want to say it succinctly, most of us overvalue what we have, and we undervalue what we have to gain. By taking a risk. By taking the risk. Oh, gosh, that's so you know, You know, Garth Brooks, you know, he sings that song about getting mm-hmm. in the fire. Yeah. You know, stand, get in the fire. Well, yeah, I might get burned. Yes, you might. <laughs> But get in the arena, you know, fight in the, I mean, that's what life is all about. And I think a coach said it, but it's probably a a very well-known quote. I want to leave it all on the field, you know, whether I win or lose, I want to leave it all on the field. So getting started with my first restaurant in 1992, I can't tell you how my uncle flew from Detroit to have a talk with me. (laughs) And here's what he said to me. He said, boy, you're going to leave a good job and step out here and all of that. Jason, he loved me. He didn't mean me any harm. He knew what I was going to face trying to become the first black to own a McDonald's. Protect you, right? yeah. <laughs> wanted to protect me. Yeah. He loved me. But no one could be more proud that on my groundbreaking day in July of 2020, I sent him a ticket to fly to Birmingham to be a part of my groundbreak of the first African-American-owned McDonald's. And there's so much to talk about. I capture some of it in the book. Yeah, but the, they're going to have to read the book. Right? <laughs> and everything that he warned me about was true. Yeah. <laughs> but what he didn't know is that I have now been built for this, not just for me, not just for me. Even going into business, we've always known, my son and I, that you know, it's going to be a ministerial piece to this. What does it mean to be the first African-American to own a McDonald's? It wasn't about the business or about the money. It was about the example, the hope that you're creating to show an example uh, as to why we don't have to be so reticent, so standoffish about exercising the gifts that we have. And that's what I get to do today. 
Uh, and so I'm just thrilled to be in that space to make a difference. You know, I mean, making a dollar, that's a wonderful thing, but making yeah. a difference is awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So good. All right. So unfortunately, we're, we're, we've got like a minute left. I mean, there's so much we can get to about your pursuit of excellence because, you know, not only were you uh, a hard worker, but I believe you had, you realized that your work, your signature was on everything you did. And so you wanted to do things to the best of your ability. And there was a lot of folks that you recognize a lot of folks that were just doing things kind of halfway. You also talk in the book about how like you, you recognize that your success was going to be heavily dependent on the success of others. So there's so much good stuff in this book, but I wanted you to close us out on the title and you've touched on it a little bit. Why not win? What does this title mean? Yeah, well, it's a it's it's a question, and I'll give you a sense of where it came from. I'm watching the NBA Finals and played in at that time uh, mid '80s uh, Celtics and the Lakers, and uh, there was this kind of nondescript, non-identified three line quote: "The game has been scheduled, so we have to play. Why not win?" And if you take those words and you kind of play with them a little bit and apply them to your life. You have been born, so you have to live. Why not win? I mean, what if we approached every day with that term? Those words sat with me, and I knew that they would reverberate with me and in my mind for the rest of my life, which led to this book that's now creating winning opportunities for other people. There's a graphic novel version of this book coming out now. It's being written by eminent scholar, Dr. Dave Ketchin uh, from Auburn. He's written several graphic novels. Uh, A gentleman read the book, said the book needs to be in graphic novel, sent a $20,000 check so that it could sponsor that. I mean, these serendipitous occurrences are not just serendipity. You know, coming from a person who, if there was a category in our yearbook that identified the most unlikely to succeed at anything, that would have been my picture. But the message is that we should not allow, Jason, our missteps to define us. And every day, every day, there are people, you're frequenting them and I am frequenting them, who are held up, held hostage by something that happened six months ago, six years ago. And We can't get past. My prayer is, oh, God, help me to get over what I can't seem to get past. Mm. And once we can do that, I mean, the world is ours. Forgive yourself. Forgive people. That's trivial. It's narrow thinking so that you get all of that stuff out of your way so that you can be all that you can be. Not for you, not just for your family, but we believe that we're a blessing so many people on a daily basis and what we do every day. And I I just thank God for this awesome opportunity to have the book, to have the Institute, to do what I was called to do. And Ms. Nichols plays a significant role in every, every ounce of the way of that. Mm, God bless her. Uh, Cause uh, the ripple effect has been amazing. All right. So what do you got to plug? Got a website? Uh, Is there a place where we can go and buy your art or commission your art? I mean, if I'm listening, I just I want to yeah. see you speak somewhere. Or what, sure. How can I get some Larry Thornton in my life? Well, if you could go online to uh, LarryThornton.com, I believe it's called. You know, you get to a point where you have these handlers. Yes. And so I don't I don't get <laughs> they just drink. Google Larry yeah, Larry yeah, Thornton. Larry Thornton, and then the <laughs> Why Not Win Institute. So from the book. Uh, The lady who wrote, just so that you'll have this context, the lady who wrote the introduction to that book, Dr. Zilla Fluker, she is the executive director of the uh, Institute. And just to tell you how that happened, so she reads the manuscript so as to write the introduction. She comes back and she says, Larry, we've got something here. And I have no idea what she's talking about. She's in secondary education, so she knows this stuff. Thank God for those that you can put around you that know what you do not know. You don't need to know everything. Yeah. You know, we didn't talk about it, but I couldn't even read my financial statements, the first set that I got. But I knew somebody who could read them. Right. That's And if you build relationships, you get it done. But anyway, she says, Larry, I have extracted, very much like you opened the uh, podcast, I have extracted over 100 quotes from this manuscript. And she subsequently wrote a a, uh, curriculum from 
the book. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. So we That's do awesome. sessions on uh, winning communication. Winning everything is around winning outcomes, winning relationships. You incorporated. That, that's one of my favorite. You, yeah. Y-O-U-I-N-C. You know, everybody is in business. How are you running your individual personal corporation? Are you open every day? You know, are you growing? Are you researching your product? I mean, we go into it, and it, 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 we'd like to think that it helps people to see differently. Because I'm telling you, when you change what you think, you change what you do. And uh, we just love having this platform uh, for doing just that. We've been on over 30 college campuses, and we've got about six to eight uh, colleges that are in the queue for this book. In fact, we can't get around to all of them. Thank God my son is there and stepping into leadership to run our seven uh, restaurants that we own and operate. And uh, so I still serve on a couple of boards, which will be rolling off after a while. But what I'm doing today, I could do every day because yeah. I think it's helping, uh, help, helping people to think differently about themselves. Well, I would, yeah, I was sitting here just thinking, why in the heck haven't I bought a copy of this book for every one of my agents? You know, like <laughs> when they come on board... Here's the copy. I wow. mean, because that needs to happen, in my opinion. But gosh, I just I want to thank you again for coming on. I know you're super busy, and uh, this has been one of my all time favorite episodes. And I know it's going to have a, a big impact on the audience, and it's going to get shared. And a lot of people are going to be buying your books online and reaching out to right. you. So it's really and, exciting. And keep in mind that. I do not sell my art. My art is given everything to me. I give my art. So if you see anything in that book that you like, I'd love to get one matted and framed for you. This is a nonprofit with the, the uh, book as well. Wow. I mean, East Tennessee State bought 2,000 books. Now, as an entrepreneur, you know, you start to thinking, <laughs> yeah. you know, should this be a nonprofit? <laughs> well, maybe we'll talk on, on book two. You know, right. superintendent of Birmingham City Schools read the book, bought 1,300 copies for every high school in Birmingham. I mean, it's just awesome. And all I'm saying is I close out. Miss Nichols, are you getting all of this? <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, one last question. We can, yeah. we, like, listeners, can they hire you to speak? Do you do public speaking gigs? Yeah, through the Institute. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. We, we look for those opportunities, and we're funded. You know, Coca-Cola is our business, largest supporter, and Alabama Power is coming on. So it's just kind of creating this kind of momentum because we think, I mean, we might be naive, but we think that we're really making a difference to helping people to do what Ms. Nichols did for me. There's no greater joy than that. I shudder to think if I had missed her class, if I had gotten away. So as a result of that, I'm careful of what I run away from because I might be so unfortunate as to get away. I know you're certainly making an impression. You made an impression on me, which right. inspires me to have you on this podcast. So hopefully I can use this podcast as a, a vehicle to make a difference. So um, you're doing you're doing great work. Awesome. And I appreciate this opportunity so much. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Larry. Great. Thanks for listening to the Impact Agent Podcast. If you like the show and got something out of it, please like the Impact Agent Podcast on Facebook and rate and review the show on iTunes or anywhere you listen to podcasts. This really helps us grow the show and helps other agents find it. Please share it with your friends and coworkers as well. You want us to deliver the show to you via email every week? Then email me at jason at impactagentuniversity.com and we'll send you the show every week. Please let us know what you think about the show, what you like, what you don't. We'll possibly make a suggestion about a topic you want to hear. Leave us a message on Facebook at Impact Agent Podcast. This podcast is produced by Johnny Gwynn at Deep Rod Studios in Mobile, Alabama. Until next week, everybody be productive, safe, and happy, and always keep learning.